So I'm not gonna call this worst books of 2018 because they're not really worst books. They're not bad books. I will just say that they're frustrating books of 2018. Um, or books that made me feel a lot of things and those things were mainly um, anger, frustration, irritation, and confusion. Um, so let's start off. I have in my 2018 reads folder on Goodreads, I just reversed my ratings. And the first book that popped up is This Ho Got Roaches in Her Kit Crib um, by Quan Mills. The book is also titled otherwise on Amazon, This Bitch Got Roaches in Her Crib. Um, it's about a girl. Well, no, it's not about a girl. It is adult. It's an adult books, uh, book and it follows three separate two-ish, maybe three characters. So Austin Watkins is a 35-year-old man who's in prison for uh, drug-related things. Not sure. Um, and he has a daughter on the outside who, who is living with her mother, Fred Keisha, who is the worst kind of mother out there. She's abusive to a young daughter while she um, dotes on her two sons. She is negligent, she is awful, and her reason for having children is so that she can use their government subsidized money for her own. So in general, a hot, horrible person. And the young girl's name is Maya. We also get a couple of perspectives from her grandmother, but like, I don't, maybe it's relevant to the grand story, but it's not really. Um, so it's following this grand battle that her grandmother and Austin are trying to get custody of Maya from Fred Keisha, who's built up this narrative uh, that Austin is a horrible person and the fact that he's in jail kind of, you know, gives merit to Fred Keisha's story. It's a weird book. This, it, it talks about the Chicago um, prison and jail system, the Chicago uh, law, how that affects the black community. It affects it talks about sh child protective services in Chicago and how the process actually helping a child in a difficult situation is so backed up, first of all, because of the volume. And also, urgency isn't given to every situation as it needs because of how many situations there are that need to be taken care of. And also, the unfair bias that women sometimes have in situations like this um, because society has been groomed to consider mothers to be the ones to take care and fathers to be negligent, especially in black families where the government and private systems have put in regulations and societal things where black families were separated, fathers were forced away from their families, and that kind of has become a stereotype in America and it's harming young children who need help because like because of several different things and it tackles a lot of niche struggles of the black community in chicago and i'm not one to really talk and comment on it but based on a lot of my art history related knowledge architecture related knowledge in and like social political related classes that I've taken in university, like everything that I read in this book was what I've learned and was very real. So like, it's a heartbreaking story to read. The author spends so much time ragging on Fred Keisha for her appearance, for being a woman and for being poor. That, like, the impact of what he's trying to say about mothers being abusive and, you know, fathers, incarcerated men, not giving, not getting, you know, the due process that they deserve, like, all of that kind of... It's overwhelmingly sexist at times, but only against Fred Keisha. Like, he chose to be specifically awful in describing this woman because she's an awful person, and I think of course, horrible people should not be treated in illustrious, illustrious ways, but he chose to attack aspects of her that she really couldn't help. 
and those are like things that we have social movements for in this day and age. Um, sex positivity, positivity, like body positivity and employment and like helping people who are financially in trouble, like those are things that are relevant in this day and age and the author chooses to bash this abuser for those specific aspects of her identity which just kind of why would you do that you know kind of made me mad but she's also a horrible person so i guess like it kind of doubles down on making you hate her didn't really do that for me um also the writing hella weird there's a lot of symbolism in cockroaches like he, he personifies cockroaches specifically to comment on the state of Fritkisha's living and on I thought there were weird things that really didn't need metaphors that had metaphors in the form of cockroaches okay I guess <laughs> yeah those were like two big things that kind of made me angry with the book also should those two things negate the value of the narrative that this book is trying to put forth and so I didn't give it a rating because I didn't know if I should rate it badly for two things that I think are relevant things to rate a book on or well for how important this book is in opening conversation on very important topics in the city of Chicago itself Next a book that I'm gonna say I had problems with, I'm just gonna mention a bunch of them together because they're all in the same genre of you pissed me off. Walk on Earth a Stranger, uh, Into the Bright Unknown, and Like a River Glorious by Ray Carson. It's like a fantasy a Wild West um, trilogy where our main character who has witchy skills of finding and manipulating as in like telekinetic abilities with gold specifically. So she's traveling across the continent to get away from her uncle who probably killed her father and set up a life for herself. Oh, I should also mention Retribution Rails, which I read this year. I read Vengeance Road last year, I think, and Retribution Rails this year. But either way, they're also in the same line of like cross-dressing girls in the Wild West who choose to dress up as men so that they could, you know, easily move around. So my issue with books, like they're not actually bad books. The stories were interesting. I thought um, the Ray Carson's trilogy was a little lackluster because the gold, her gold digging abilities don't really aren't really developed. She's really the only one with powers until halfway through this third book and like other than Wild West politics and the gold rush there's no fantasy element to how her gold senses are involved in the story and that made me mad because you can't like it just felt like a missed opportunity um, and so I was upset about that but what really set me off or it sets me off about western books following female characters that are exemplified and glorified as like wow wild west feminism is that they all inevitably somehow use girls dressing up as boys white girls specifically dressing up as boys to talk about female liberty and feminism and you know freedom for women in today's day and age like what i'm getting from these books and maybe i'm just reading too much into it what this cross-dressing narrative tells me is that um white women continue to consider being seen as white men as equality um Let's explain. This is a thing a lot with men of color as well, with queer men, queer cis men, and um, white women. Bringing themselves up to the standards and the privilege of white male men is good enough. And then 
springboarding off the backs of queer non-cis men and queer women of color is how they gain that status of equality. That's my problem with white feminism today. How that ties into westerns with this stupid trope of cross-dressing as men is that it I think these authors think that like talking about women dressed up as men and get gaining liberty liberties I think they think that this is them saying something profound about feminism about freedom and about like oh men have more rights look at how much freedom this girl has like that's what they're saying but what I as a woman of color am getting is that white women consider equality to be their own liberties being equivalent to that of white men in society and that's fucking selfish like it's annoying that there's no nuance beyond being equal to white men not leveling out the playing field not equality for all identities and all sexualities no it's equal to white men and that's it you know like modern third wave i think fourth wave feminism and womanism have other aspects to it that cross-dressing western novels fail to get and it could be strong commentary on subverting gender binaries on further commenting on race relations all of that is just overlooked for a simple like Oh, look at me, I'm a white man, I can, you know, spin around a gun and help carry heavy things. I'm equal to men now because I'm dressed up as a man. Stupid. <laughs> and ridiculous. And insulting. And annoying. And vapid. And empty. And completely fucking irrelevant. Also being said in the Wild West, following white women, both these authors have made valiant, valiant efforts in representing Native Americans, representing black characters, and perhaps representing queer characters as well. Efforts have been made, but then again, one black character? No. One Native American character? Mm-mm. One Asian character? I can't even give you a you tried star because that's how little effort I see these authors have made. Like, I'm sure, I'm sure they were not intending on being offensive, on being patronizing, on being insufficient. I'm sure they thought their efforts were important. And I'm sure that they also considered the fact that they're not the authorities in writing these stories and therefore didn't go further into the detailings of the representations and the minorities that they chose to put in their books. But even the little effort that there is, is not even done right. Like you're getting all of these experiences during this manifest destiny time period of America, you're getting these minority experiences through the eyes of a white girl, through the eyes of a heterosexual white girl, through the eyes of a relatively privileged white girl, and all I'm seeing is some white savior complex. Uh, that's all I'm gonna say. Not very articulate. And I'm incredibly infuriated by A, how stupid Wild West books tend to be, um, with female male, how stupid feminist Wild West books tend to be. I'm infuriated by my lack of articulation on this topic and having had to read them. Anyways, um, I think I gave all of these books like 2.5, 3-ish stars. I actually gave Ventures of Road and Retribution Rails 4 stars because they were decent stories, but they made me angry. Um, I also gave Everless, like, by Sarah Holland, two stars. I thought the story was unoriginal. Um, I can't even tell you what it's about. I think the girl has some kind of powers of something. She gets taken into the royal palace to serve as a servant. I don't even know. There's a twist ending. It was so irrelevant. T 
tired. The tropes were tired and boring and not even put in a combination that was remotely interesting to me. I could say so much about diversity, about having queer characters in there, about having non-white characters in there. I could say so much. We know the issues with books like that. I just thought it was unoriginal and formulaic. What else? I think those truly were the only books that I didn't like all that much. I could also say that An Ember in the Ashes series by Sabah Tahir. I know everyone loved those and like for some reason I just can't seem to get into that. I, I see how the uniqueness of the story. I see the importance of the representation and the diversity, not just with the main character, but there's more than the main character and her brother as brown characters. I see the importance of like the scholars versus the Romans, the empire, like the symbolic narrative of slavery, of imperialism in um, the book, but I still don't find myself interested or even hooked in the story. That's it. There's nothing bad. I just wasn't. There's something missing for me and I can't put my finger on it. And I will mention the Red Queen series. Uh, Red Queen, Glass, Sword, something something, War Storm. All four books I read this. All four on audiobook. I started the series because people were like, controversial. I was like, okay, let's hop on the drama. First book, tropey, hackneyed, and predictable. Nothing made me mad about it. Romance? I could dig it. I started reading because Cal and Mare were cute and compelling. And then I realized that there's a whole host of people who are like in love with Maven. You do you, but he's literally abusive. <laughs> Why would you want your main character to be with someone who's abusive? It's misunderstood. Yes, the horrible acts that he commits are his alone to bear. And like, to quote Jake Peralta from Brooklyn Nine-Nine, cool motive, still murder. Like, <laughs> I don't get the love for Maven. Compelling villain, not a love interest. The character dynamics in that same line of tangent, the character dynamics were interesting because the amount of pain that Cal and Mayer had for, you know, being distanced and hate starting to, like, realize that Maven was actually probably irredeemable. I don't know, that ending kind of made me upset that, like, four books wasted, romance insufficiently resolved. <laughs> Yeah, that's all that made me angry about that series. It's nothing special, it wasn't horrible, and I don't think it's overhyped. I understand why people like it. I was just let down by people not ending up with whom they should have. That's it. Those are the books that were questionably, arguably irritating, frustrating, um, confusing to me this year to the point where I didn't give them a star rating or I gave them, actually I didn't even give all of these bad ratings. I was just like pissed off at some parts by reading them. That's all. That's all this video is about. Books that irritated. Books that were um, not easy to rate. That's, that's what this video will be called. Books that are not easy to rate. Okay. I'm really out of my groove in terms of filming. Okay, goodbye. Happy New Year.